welcome to another issue of the public interest. My name is David Granger, and in this series of programs, we examine issues of public interest. And of course, the, the, one of the most important issues today is um, the issue of, of human safety, of public security. And each one of us, each citizen, must ask himself or herself whether we feel safe in Guyana at the present time. In my view, um, from the time the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration returned to office in 2020, we saw a, a return to the sort of performance of the police force that we witnessed in the 2000s. It seems as if the last 20 years um, have not really <laughs> taught the PPPC any lessons in public security. And of course, when you look at the amount of people appearing in different places, you can say, oh, I recognize him from 2003. A lot of the old faces are coming back. And I was very disturbed, you know, was, maybe you say, you know, I'm, I'm too old to be disturbed at these things, but to listen to what was being said at the recent uh, Annual Officers Conference of the Ghana Police Force. And I must thank the speakers for their, for their candor, for their frankness. But we are told quite recently that 21 policemen are actually before the courts, you know, as of April uh, 2023, on criminal charges. Four were charged in January, February. One was charged with laundering <laughs> stolen money. Another was charged with accepting a $200,000 bribe. Two were charged for drugs and ammunition possession. Another is on $1.6 million bail for manslaughter. You know, things, things got so bad that um, the uh, Minister of Home Affairs had to take an extraordinary step of uh, creating a detention center in the police force, you know, literally to protect citizens from the policemen. There were so many rogue policemen that for the first time in the history of this 184-year-old force, a detention center has to be established inside the police force to hold policemen who are accused of crimes um, uh, and um, to await the findings of, of the courts. In addition to that, and I go back to the recent police officers conference, this is not old stuff, this is not history, this is current affairs. They're now blaming the lack of a comprehensive structure to respond to crimes in the hinterland. My friends, <laughs> The hinterland has been there from time immemorial. We know the site of the hinterland. It was the APNU, AFC administration, which divided up that whole hinterland, which comprises 75% of Guyanese territory, into four police divisions. Before that, it was one division. The divisional commander used to be sitting down quietly in um, Rabbit Walk, Eve Leary, uh, commanding territory covering 75% of Guyana. And we created four divisions. Region 1 now has its own division. Region 7 has its own division. Region 8 has its own division. Region 9 has its own division. So the police force now has a division to cover every part of the country. But we knew the problems of the hinterland, and they will not go away unless this administration wakes up to the fact that there are problems. And listen to the commissioner of police himself. He says the police stations are too far away from where the crimes are committed. Well, nobody goes in the police compound to commit a crime. Of course, they're committed in what we call the bush. Um, it means that the policemen cannot get to the crime scene. And sometimes when they get to the crime scene, <laughs> of course, the, the criminals are gone. Um, then he complained about negative social media influence. Uh, that is pervasive. He complained about substance abuse language barriers. My friends, let me say this. There are nine indigenous nations or tribes in Guyana. And many of the older folk 
speak their native language as the first language. And some of them speak English as a second language. But there are areas in the Burima Waini where people do not speak English at all. And many of the 36,000 migrants coming in from Venezuela are Waro. <laughs> and if they speak a second language, it's Spanish. The first language is Waro, the second language is Spanish. So of course it's a language barrier because the policemen in Burima Waini do not speak Waro or Spanish. Um, anyhow, this is a complaint, language barrier. Uh, everyone knows there's a language barrier problem. Then there's gender-based violence, especially you know, interpersonal violence, domestic violence. There's transnational crime. Criminals coming across the border. We've dealt with this issue over and over again. The, the gangs are called syndicatos. They're not really syndicatos, they're bandidos. That's what they are, the bandidos. And they come across, rob Guyanese, and go back over. Sometimes they shoot Guyanese, shoot the policemen. Um, then there's cyber threats, narco trafficking. This is not news. Illegal migration, porous borders. And of course, there is an increase in mental health related crimes. Everything that the Commissioner of Police reported at the Annual Officers Conference 2023 has been known 20, 30 years ago. But what did we hear at that conference? Um, listen to these words, and I'm quoting verbatim, and I quote, to see officers and their ranks cleaning medians, painting roadways, building houses, delivering hampers, cleaning drains, Walking in a community, talking to every section of the guy to, is most admirable. Are we living in two countries? One in which the commissioner is complaining about crime in the hinterland, and two in which the policemen are being praised for cleaning medians and painting roadways. To my mind, it seems that the policemen are in the wrong place. They should be in the hinterland protecting the indigenous communities from the Venezuelan syndicatos and catching criminals and stopping gun running and narco trafficking and people trafficking. So we can see that whatever the policy is, um, things are going all the way back to where we were in 2000. Um, I don't think Seriously, this is a time for able-bodied, trained policemen to be painting roadways and cleaning trenches and cleaning the medians. I am sure the mayor of the city of the of, the, of Guyana's ten tongues could find other people to do these tasks. And the policemen must do what they are paid to do, that is to keep citizens safe. What we're seeing, as I said, is an unprecedented step in the 184-year-old history of the Guyana Police Force for the Minister of Home Affairs to create this detention center for delinquent policemen accused of committing crimes. And it is symptomatic of the rot that exists now in the law enforcement agency, that the police, the you know, are the criminals and the public has to be protected from the police so instead of locking up criminals in jails we know lock up the policemen because um policemen are committing a lot of these offenses my friends there have been many strategic blunders and unfortunately again recently we heard of the most senior public servant in the public security sector, you know, facing some controversial issues. I will not go into that. You can read about it in the media. But when you have the most senior public servant, the person at the pinnacle of administration in the public security sector, becoming involved in the type of controversy, we need explanations. And it is bound to have an impact on the way other countries deal with Guyana and the way the security forces deal with the Ministry of, of, of Home Affairs, as it's now called. 
Where did this problem arise from? How was it caused? Let us look a bit at causation. There's hardly anything new in the problems that the commissioner complained about. Literally, for the last quarter of a century, the People's Progressive Civic Administration has refused, not ignored or neglected, refused to implement what I would call root and branch reform. And this is what set the scene for the troubles which broke out in 2000, 2001, 2002, and went on for nearly a decade. And during that period, there were at least a dozen massacres. And I'm, when I speak of massacre, I'm, I'm speaking about what the United Nations de de defines as a massacre. And when you kill three or four people in one place, it becomes a massacre. That's not murder. And you know the story. We had murders, we had massacres at Kitty, Lamar Garden, Border, Buxton Friendship, Prasad Nagara, Rickler Eccles, La Bon Intention, Baggettstown, Eccles, Blackbush, Polder, Bartica, Lusignan, and most of all, Lindo Creek. Lindo Creek was a massacre. So you can check all of these in the news. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them in detail, but these 12 massacres characterized more than anything else that era we know as the Troubles. And a lot of people who were at Lindo Creek are still around. You're going to hear more about them from them. What has happened is that the failure of the police force to ensure citizens' safety in the light of this, it's not a surge, it is now a continuing trend of serious crime, of armed robbery, of banditry, murder, piracy. These crimes, both local, national, and transnational, are the result of two decades of deliberate disregard for the essential needs of public security. There has been official interference. And quite recently, we can see this the clumsy manipulation or the attempts to manipulate the Police Service Commission. The clumsy interference in officers' promotion, the, the appointment of, of what can only be called a, a bizarre team of public relations persons um, all of these things have damaged public security and have damaged the morale of the policemen. Um, uh, the police force, like any large organization, like army, fire service, um, you know, experiences something called esprit de corps, camaraderie, morale, however you choose to define it. And that esprit de corps, that morale, um, was damaged. You know, when you remove uh, or attempt to remove respected retired serving senior and retired, retired and serving senior police officers on charges of fraud, you know, um, the, the policemen wonder is if this is how they treat you know, respected police officers, what will happen to us down at the bottom of the pit? And then there's this comical deployment of policemen on municipal chores, you know, cleaning in the media. Well, I, I, I really don't think it's admirable. I think they should be pursuing criminals in the hinterland um, and uh, along the coastline. And we all know where those crimes are being uh, committed. And then Look at what is happening at the Police uh, Service Commission. It is my view, it's my information that this is the first time in history of that commission that you don't have former uh, experienced police officers serving in it. It is headed by a pastor. You have a lawyer, you have businessmen. But I think omitting, omitting distinguished former police officers um, or excluding them from that commission is, uh, is an administrative error, 
serious administrative error and it's a departure from good practice. And then we have the police killings. What is taking place is that although nothing could compare with the seriousness of the atrocities during the troubles, those 12 massacres that I ran through a few minutes ago, uh, the extrajudicial killing or whoever you want to define it, of the region, two businessmen. <laughs> Can you imagine a man and his wife, four o'clock in the morning in a, a really reasonably remote village of Dartmouth and Escribo Coast, is killed in his bed. And up to now, the public cannot understand, you know, why this matter hasn't been, you know, finalized. Then we had the, the shooting to death of somebody in Main Street, 100 meters from the president's residence. Um, we don't know who did it. And then we had the, the shooting in Region 4 on the East Coast. Um, this one definitely involved uh, another policeman. And, and of course, the, you can go back to the um, Crom Ewing murders, and you can go back to the killing of the three protesters at um, in Linden at, um, in 2012. And again, the people who were involved in the shooting of those protesters at Linden are still around and in prominent places. It means that the public perception of the police force as a result of these killings, that perception has diminished. I mean, it can almost have been destroyed that there is a loss of confidence in the police force to, uh, to protect them. And these extrajudicial killings need to be dealt with promptly. And I do not think it could be said that the, uh, the performance of the police force has been um, stellar um, um, in, in any regard. Um, but hindland policing, again, the commissioner referred to this. And it is no easy matter to simply brush it aside. It is not um, some sideshow, um, you know, bush behavior. From August 2020, there has been a spate of light aircraft landing, and these are not discovered until they crash and cannot get back in the air. We've had light aircraft landing over the last 30 months at Bissaruni, at Estano, at Kurduni, at Kokwani, Madia, and Oriella, large amounts of cocaine. And in some instances, the cocaine was actually found. So whoever was supposed to be the recipient couldn't get there in time. And this is what has been happening over the last 30 months. During my tenure as president, I had set up, yes, I did set up the National Intelligence Security Agency. We'll deal with that on another occasion. But I also set up the National Anti-Narcotics Agency. And that agency was quickly dissolved, although the administration decided to keep and reform the NISC. The other agency, the National Anti-Narcotics Agency, has been dissolved, completely dismantled, NANA. And that is one of the reasons why these planes are landing, bringing white powdery stuff into our country. And we have to deal with other situations. For example, in the Brino Waini region, region one, it is reported by credible sources that over 36,000 Venezuelan migrants have entered Guyana, many of them over the last three years. And it is a problem that has been developing before that. I'm not saying that this occurred only under the PPP administration. But there is no comprehensive framework to use the language of the police force. There is no comprehensive framework to manage it. So you have case in which Venezuelans are running brothels. Venezuelans are getting involved in murder. Venezuelans are getting involved in all sorts of crime. Because these people are coming into the country, and there is no control. And the police, who do, by and large are not Spanish speakers, cannot control the inflow 
of those um, migrants. Uh, in fact, I should call it the influx of those migrants to give you an idea. So we still have banditry, contraband smuggling, drug trafficking, gun running, people trafficking, illegal migration, especially along the isolated rivers and uh, in, in, in fact, between Venezuela and Ghana, there's roughly 800 kilometer border and much of it is river and you can walk across the river in dry season. The police force does not have aircraft um, to patrol the borders. It does not have the land transport and you know how the police treat the land transport. At least during my tenure, we were recipient of a large amount of vehicles from the People's Republic of China. And they're still buying police vehicles. And um, a week or two after the police um, received those vehicles, you can see the pictures in the papers. And we need to look carefully at the way the police force is being managed. We need to have those assets, air, river, and land, um, to get, allow police to get to the scenes of crimes, particularly in the timber grants and the gold mining areas, and also the villages to protect the indigenous people from the syndicatos. And there are more problems. We saw another, you know, <laughs> ham fisted, bungled, crude attempt to man manipulate the police association elections. In one morning, Two chairpersons were elected separately <laughs> um, in the police association. And the ex-police association of America refused to recognize it. The Guyana Ex-Police Association of Canada refused to recognize those elections. The Caribbean Federation of, the, of Police Welfare Associations refused to recognize. What is taking place in the, in the police force? Why? is a path being pursued, which is leading to discrediting our police force and to hold the police force up to ridicule. That is what is happening. There is no framework for managing um, reform. Um, the PPP administration has been receiving reports um, for over 25 years. Throughout its 23 year regime, Police um, reports uh, or investigations um, were, pre uh, were pre or re reports for the reform of the police, or particularly by the British government. We've had other assistance, but they set up numerous um, uh, relationships in order to improve the police uh, performance. And I mean, they're, they're really kilograms of reports, which you can study if you're interested in it. There's a National Steering Committee on Crime, the National Commission of Law and Order. Um, United Nations, United Kingdom experts came down here from the Metropolitan Police and the Scottish Police College. Up to now, you can still see reports from the Scottish Police uh, College. The Regional uh, Advisor on National Security Strategy produced a report. Um, then the government at that time during the trouble produced something called a menu of measures, 100, 100 million, well, that was a drop in the bucket. Then there's the National Drug Strategy Master Plan, which um, has been ignored. Um, when Barnes Amos came down here, it was something called a statement of principles. And uh, after she left, she put in place um, uh, an agreement by which the UK, what is called DFID, the Department for International Development, put, uh, actually signed an agreement. The British High Commissioner and the head of the Presidential Secretary actually signed on the dotted line. And a few days later, the government just said it's rejected a three million pounds sterling uh, reform plan um, was simply thrown out of the window. When I got into office, I had to asked the British government to put the plan back and we started to reform the force again. And then there be, there's been the passage of anti-crime bills. Oh, yeah, there are four major anti-crime bills, you know, criminal law, offenses amendment, prevention of crime, racial hostility. 
But bills do not implement themselves. And unless you have a robust police force, these crimes will continue. And uh, we all need to understand that security sector reform um, is not a plaything. You need to have some mechanism. And under the original British plan, a secretariat was envisaged. Under my administration, there was a secretary to push the plan. And we had also, you remember, the Discipline Forces Commission. Those recommendations have not been implemented. And it means that no single independent institution is overseeing police reform. So we are still in free fall. And what the commissioner had to say in April 2023 about delinquent policemen and inability to control crime in Hitler um, is going to continue until this administration gets serious about police reform, not about cleaning medians, about police reform, root and branch. Uh, we need, therefore, to get away from the bluster. You know, we've been told that um, uh, there's going to be a program for, uh, I like this one, restructuring, repositioning, rebranding, reorganizing, retooling, reengineering, and repairing the, you know, seven hours. Uh, well, uh, it, it, it's some good in the media, and maybe if you're in an election campaign, this sort of thing would go down well. But in reality, all seven of these hours require a tremendous effort that neither the government nor the police force um, um, seem to be capable or even interested in implementing. The result is that the image, it's more than image, the performance of the police force has been badly damaged. Where do we go from here? I am not speaking about a, a, a new initiative. I'm speaking about measures which were being considered over the last 25 years. And I must say that the British government has been behind some of these measures for police reform. I have worked with them. I've spoken with, um, with, with the former British Prime Minister, British Foreign Minister, uh, and, and um, the appointed, and of course the High Commissioner, and they appointed um, an advisor, and we were working together. But many of those recommendations have been thrown out of the window. And we're now going back to the old method, which didn't work then. And that is what caused the troubles in the early 2000s. And that is what causes the poor performance of the police today. What I can say, therefore, in conclusion, is that these problems are self-inflicted injuries by the PPP civic administration and by the administration of the Ghana police force. I think on both sides, the government and the force know what needs to be done. But you cannot develop a professional and independent police force if you intend only to put your, your boys in key positions. You need to allow proficient officers to be trained and to implement um, the law under the Police Act without putting your favorites um, in, in positions for which they're not qualified. And as a result, the police is suffering. But more, more than that, the Guyanese people are less safe now than they were during the APNU AFC administration. And the question of public safety, of citizen security, is, um, is one that needs to be answered. Right now, human safety is deteriorating and the police force needs to be guided and directed uh, along the lines of uh, security sector reform that the APNU AFC administration outlined between 2015 and 2020. If this were done, we'd all be happier and Guyana would be a much safer place um, for you and your children to live. Thank you, and may God bless you.
Each man must do his 